Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session. My name is Adam Long. I'm the VP of Product Management at a company called Automated Insights. This is my colleague, Rob. Hello, everyone. I'm Rob McCauley. I'm a solutions architect with the Alexa Skills team based in Boston, Massachusetts. And what we're going to be talking about is what we're calling the sort of cutting edge of voice design, where we think designing Alexa skill responses is going in the future using a technology called natural language generation. So agenda for today, um, we're going to get pretty technical here. We're going to do a lot of hands-on stuff to show you how natural language generation works and how you can integrate it into an Alexa skill. So first, I want to talk a little bit about how design evolves on new platforms, what natural language generation is, and then we'll get into sort of the more technical hands-on stuff. So why is this important? Well, I think if you look at design as a metaphor and how it evolves on different platforms, a fitting metaphor is the web, right? Back when Amazon first started, the web was a really ugly looking thing. It was white backgrounds, black text, blue underlined words all over the place, maybe three images on the page, because that's all modems could handle at the time. Uh, Amazon's got one of the first buttons over there, that Go button. But look how they've evolved today. So this is just a screen grab of their, their Black Friday website. And they've taken the best of magazine design and all the layout and design tricks that we've learned about making something beautiful, huge images that are full bleed, go edge to edge, mixed with great interactive buttons that have affordance, meaning the, uh, the idea that it's clickable, that's visual. That transition happens on all platforms. You start with something really basic as the early adopters get onto the platform that don't think about design very much, don't make it this humane, well-designed, ergonomic uh, design system or aesthetic. And over time, we build up that capability as we learn what humans want and how, uh, how they like to interact with things. And Rob makes a metaphor all the time about how mobile is the same way, where developers had to teach us to use the gestures with angry birds to swipe and pull back and launch the bird at the tower. That design metaphor emerged over time, and we all learned it. It's the same with voice design. But there's something very particular about voice design that's different from these, which is that these are uh, based on an interface that we already know. We all communicate through voice, through conversation. So we know what that interface is supposed to be like. And so the challenge for us as designers of Alexa skills is how to capture that aesthetic of what it means to sound human and try to lift up that uncanny valley that you fall into where you start sounding a little robotic despite having a very natural sounding voice speaking the text to you. So what do I mean by this? Um, you're familiar with natural language understanding because you've all used Alexa at this point. Natural lan language understanding is a subset of natural language processing, NLP. And the idea is that we can take inputs from humans phrased in all kinds of different ways in different languages through audio or text and try to get at the intent behind that query. Try to figure out what the person is actually asking for, despite the many permutations of phrasing and diction that they may have used to get us there. And so, as you know, the Alexa device, it can handle all the different kinds of questions you could ask it when you're just trying to ask for the weather. It understands that you phrase things in different ways, but it's, it's fine with it. It knows it's a forecast request, and it goes and hits your Lambda or whatever code is behind the scenes there to service that. The problem, I think, for voice design is that we have really primitive tools for building the response. Often, as you guys know, it's going into the code and you're writing a string and maybe interpolating some variable inside there and just basically doing the equivalent of mail merge. And as a result, uh, even though you've built a lot of cool questions that you can ask the Alexa and you're bringing in great information from your APIs from your company or from others, all your responses tend to start sounding the same. And this is critical for something like weather or any skill that needs high engagement, that it doesn't sound the same every single time and that it's not just a really curt, basic response to the user, but tries to get at what they want. And you know, if I was going to ask Rob what the weather is today, and then maybe four hours later, I say, hey, Rob, I forgot what you said the high was. What did you say the weather was? He's going to pick different phrasing. It's going to be different. He's going to have a little bit of that context. He may know that I'm doing something later. He's going to bring in that context of what I'm interested in that afternoon. And he's just going to pick different words just naturally. That's just sort of a basic human thing. But if our skills don't do that, we're in trouble. So that, I think, is the goal of voice design. We need to figure out ways to emulate what a human does when you ask a person a question. 
And the process of doing this is an emerging field called natural language generation. And it's the opposite of NLP or NLU. It's instead of taking raw language and trying to parse information out of it, the intent behind the query, the sentiment of our text, or something like that, the, the named entities therein, we want to take structured data and go the opposite way and make language that sounds human-like. So our company is called Automated Insights, and we are the first provider of a software as a uh, service platform for doing natural language generation. It's a product that we've branded Wordsmith. And the idea is pretty simple. You take structured information and you create prose in a variety of formats. So let me toggle over and show you a quick demo of how this works. Um, and we're gonna be getting into more technical hands-on on exactly what you do to build out these skills. Um, but let me just show you a, a basic example of a skill that I made this week for getting securities prices. Ask Wordsmith whether, oh, that's the wrong one. Ask Wordsmith prices to tell me about Amazon. So as you know, the uh, echo sim occasionally takes a few seconds. Oh yeah, sometimes it dies and we have to refresh. But what I wanna show you is how you can ask about two different things. On the one hand, a stock, and on the other, a cryptocurrency. And you can design a tailored narrative to respond back that talks about the things that are key for each of those two different products. So let's see if we can get it to work here. Ask Wordsmith Prices to tell me about Amazon. After increasing from the opening bell, Amazon's ticker came to a close that was up slightly from yesterday's. The final price was $1,172, up 0.9% on the day. So some of the key things there that I focused on in my design for that response are that I know an equity changes in very minute ways day to day, and that equity traders are interested in that sort of intraday trading disparity between the opening and the closing price. They're a little bit less interested in perhaps the two-year trend of Amazon stock. You know, you don't often hear the, your radio update on NPR as you're driving home talking about how Amazon has increased in value like 20 times over the last 15 years. They're just giving you the quick blurb, that's the update on your price, and they know you probably know the baseline. So let's contrast that with how I've designed the, the crypto response. Ask Wordsmith Prices to tell me about Bitcoin. Despite surging by more than 20x in cost during the last three months, the web's most active cryptocurrency fell $155 to a cost of $9,766. Right, so just designing different things that we're interested in. Now, all of this is powered by a software platform that I like to think of as essentially an IDE for designing natural language responses. It tries to take the programming that we do for designing our responses now and allow you to do more sophisticated things just by doing things with user interfaces that mask some of the complexity of designing really nested if statements and the subject verb agreement problems and all the things that you have to think about while you're trying to craft natural language. So I'm gonna do a full tutorial on this in just a minute, but I just wanna show you how you can have a design tool that lives in the cloud and because it operates with a RESTful API, your Alexa skill can be hitting this system to get the response back. And just to show you that, um, maybe I'll just tweak the Bitcoin response to be something, to say something funny at the beginning, like, uh, boy, I wish I bought in sooner. Right? So um, when this saves up here at the top, we can go over, and this is now live on the API. So I'm just going to use the tester service because it's a little bit faster, but this is hitting the, the same skill as before. So I'm going to ask Alexa Securities here. It's the name of my skill. And there it is, but just to play it. Boy, I wish I bought in sooner. Despite yeah, surging right. by more than 20 times. So didn't do a code deploy, didn't have to go get a developer involved, just tweaked it on the fly, and now my skill is updated. And this technology came out of a history that we have that actually predates 
uh, Alexa even being on the market and conversational UI as a design paradigm. We actually started more in journalism and that's really where natural language generation has taken hold the strongest. So we started with Yahoo Sports and their fantasy football project where if any of you are fantasy football players, you probably got this draft recap. So you draft your fantasy team, picking the best real players from all the various teams that you like and assembling a team that's ready to take on any other fantasy team out there. We tell you how you did and create this long natural language generation summary that has snark built in because sports fans want to be told that they're no good at anything at all times. Um, and we transitioned from that to working with uh, an old stalwart company in the journalism space, the Associated Press. So the largest syndicated newspaper service in the world. They use us to do quarterly earnings recaps for companies. So they actually use our software to publish directly to the financial wire. And they found that the accuracy is much higher than the humans that they had doing this before. So we actually published without an editor even looking at it. And before this technology existed, what they did was just hire 20 year olds right out of J school to you know, frantically look at the press release as the company releases their earnings, type it into a document that's basically preset for them and just has some blanks and hit publish as fast as they can. And they could cover 300 companies that way across the globe. Now they cover 3,000 and they take those uh, journalists and move them on to more valuable stuff, investigative journalism, feature writing, and they're out of this kind of grind work that they assign to junior journalists. So that experience of writing this long form content in the most uh, sort of editorially demanding environment possible helped us develop this software in a way that now we can use it in a really conversational way for lots of applications. Some of the newer stuff that we're doing, uh, integrating with companies like Tableau and Click and Power BI and Amazon, of course, that are doing these business intelligence platforms that are trying to communicate about data. Well, what if you just had a lens where you could talk like a human to a person and tell them what they need to understand instead of giving them this dashboard that is worth a thousand different possible explanations and uh, goes out to consumers, either the busy executive or the line employee that's not an analytics expert trying to understand this information, what if you could just talk to them? So these are some of the emerging ways that natural language generation is being used. Uh, and of course, the Alexa is one. So let me toggle back here to our presentation and talk to you a little bit more about why I think this is important. So one of the things that you can do if you have a more powerful design system for these natural language responses, which we'll see how to do in just a moment, is you can do more complex logic than you can conceivably do in your code without being pages and pages long of nested if statements. You can use that complex logic to get down to even deciding whether or not you put an exclamation point at the end of your sentence based on what the data is telling you. So you have very fine grained control over the language and you can do these complex branching structures because you have a tool purpose built for this. And this is important because if you're generating a sentence, you can include additional information if you think it's relevant. So you can have a second clause that's something like, and this is the highest it's ever been if you see that that's the case because now you have an environment that makes that friendly. The other thing that I think is important is what I was talking about at the beginning. We ask questions in different ways of our Alexa devices. The Alexa device should respond back to us in different ways that just vary the diction. Change your sentence structures around. Use different synonyms in place of others. But you need a tool that makes that easy. And I think this is probably the most important thing that this emerging trend of design tools for Alexa voice conversations is trying to do, which is allow non-developers to develop these skills. If it's buried within the code, even though most of us here are coders, the product managers, marketers, and domain experts, and designers in the company that are trying to design these responses don't have a great way of communicating what they want to the developer. You're in this, this sort of back and forth telephone game of how you're trying to design your Alexa responses, and the result is you just don't get as complex a response as your company is capable of doing to try to communicate about your brand voice and what the user is interested in. So I think those are the three things that if you're interested in how we make these conversational responses more human, this I think is the key, these three things. So let's get into Wordsmith a little bit. And our goal at the end of this is Rob and I are together going to build out a template and integrate it with an Alexa skill on the back end so you can see how this all works. So let's start with Wordsmith, the SaaS platform, as I mentioned, that's our design tool for this natural language generation. 
And there are really three simple components. It takes some source data. So when I was doing the Bitcoin example, I got that from a free open API uh, for getting financial information. And I send that to Wordsmith where I design a rules engine, what we call a template, that is the nested structure by which we generate this natural language generation content. And finally, of course, it creates narratives that you can send in an email, put it in a push notification, or even respond with Alexa. So our data is pretty simple. You know, if it's weather, maybe you have some city names and temperatures and conditions. If it's Bitcoin, you have opening and closing prices, historical averages, and all that fun stuff. And it, of course, generates narratives. These template structures are, on their face, fairly simple. They have three basic primitive building blocks from which you can build very complex narratives that literally have thousands of possible permutations of things they could say for a simple one or two sentence Alexa response. At their core, one of the first components are synonyms. And you'll notice this synonym in purple here, this month, goes to a whole phrase. So for us, synonyms are just random word choices. And they could be uh, a single word, or they could be as expansive as taking a sentence, flipping around the order of the phrases, picking an entirely different way of going about that sentence, all for the sake of this more human-like response. Data variables, that's that basic string interpolation that we have in our code now. And then branches are nested if-then logic. If this happens, say this phrase. Otherwise, go with this route. And we can use that to design a narrative that addresses the things that we know are most important to that user both based on the context of what they're interested in. So for Bitcoin, we looked at the really historical growth over the last three months, but also what the data is telling you. If it's the best ever performance for Bitcoin, if it surges past 9,000 for the first time, call that out. And as I mentioned, these structures are nested. So you can go as deep as you want to with it. And as I'll show you, it makes that really easy uh, in a way that I think is sim uh, uh, more simple than designing it in code yourself. Uh, even if your designer was capable of doing that. So let me jump back over here, and let's just build out a sentence together. So this is the Wordsmith interface, and we're going to start with some dead simple data, just for making a dead simple narrative. And then Rob's going to show you taking, about taking this concept of designing a forecast and actually hooking up the data and hooking up the Alexa skill. So I've got three basic uh, sets of data here. So each row is going to become a response. You can think of this source data as kind of like my unit test that I'm going to go into. I've got one row for Chicago, where it's a very sunny day, 101 degrees and clear. A second one about the city of New York, where we have snowy conditions and it's 20 degrees. And then, of course, Dallas is somewhere in the middle. It's a rainy day, 55 degrees. And so the challenge here is to design a narrative that evokes our brand voice, so it's going to have some personality to it. Let's say we're an e-commerce retailer, and we want to be able to push our products based on the weather conditions. So that's going to be kind of our primary goal. We have a certain brand voice and brand goal that we want to have. The second one is going to be to account for all the different things that could happen in weather and how we want to respond to them. And then finally, to add a bit of variability in there so that we have that sort of human-like diction selection. So taking this data, I'm going to go over to the right tab. And this is kind of the main interface of Wordsmith. Wordsmith is designed to look like Google Docs or Microsoft Word, because at its core, this is an environment for writing. This is a design tool for language. And the easiest way to get started is I'm just going to uh, start with what I know I want to say. Um, so maybe we start with our, our first phrase or clause. is going to be about pushing the product. And then we'll get into the temperature. So uh, let's say it's a scorcher out there. So pick up one of your handy, and maybe our brand will be called Amazon. It's a new name I'm playing with. Ham handy Amazon t-shirts that you, you got in your swag bag. The high is forecasted to be, uh, let's say, 101. So let's put in our temperature. And Wordsmith knows about the different types of data that you might be inserting. It knows you might have a comma-separated list of things, like an array, where you want to join them with an and or or clause. So this, this, and x. 
It knows that numbers have all kinds of things that you might want to do in natural language that you don't necessarily need to do in some of your basic math operations. You might want an ordinal ending to say it's the 101st day. Uh, if you're the Associated Press, you definitely want to write out numbers that are less than 10. Um, some people want to write out every number, for example. So we've got some of these helper functions built in to the software here. But I'm going to stick with no decimal places, just the whole round integer, 101. And this is our most basic kind of automation. If I hit preview, what it's going to do is take this uh, very rudimentary template structure, which is essentially just a string with one interpolated variable, and run it through those three sets of data and just give us three previews. So let's just see what this looks like. And pretty terribly, it's a scorcher out there, dot, 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 the highest forecasted to be 101. But look at the second and third rows, right? We haven't built any intelligence into this yet, so it's still saying it's a scorcher out there, it's forecast to be 20 degrees. So let's build that out a little bit further. The first thing that I think we want to work on here is the first sentence, where we need to branch based on uh, the weather conditions, because we want to push different products based on those different conditions. So I'm just going to highlight that sentence and click Add Branch. And what you get is essentially a a UI for creating these nested if statements. So let's branch on our conditions. And if our conditions equal clear, then we're going to focus on, on temperature, whether it's a scorcher or not. Otherwise, let's say conditions equals snow. Wow. Are you in luck? We've got an awesome parka you can buy for just 500 small dollars, right? So we've just put a little bit of our language in there that has a little personality, but we're branching on the, the condition. And the final one is rain, so I'll do just an else statement to show you that we can. Let's say, um, let's do a little French. Il fait pleu, it's raining. Get le raincoat from la Amazon. So you can do other languages, of course, because we're just pumping out a string based on this conditional logic. So you can write in Korean, Japanese, German, Spanish, Danish. We've got Dutch. We've got customers doing all of those. So now let's go back to our preview and see if we've got a little bit more intelligence there. It's a scorcher out there. Wow, are you in luck? We've got an awesome parker you can buy, and it's raining. Right? So we've got the basic language in there. Um, Let's do a little bit of work on synonyms here. Actually, one thing that we can do is it may not be a scorcher out there if the conditions are clear. It could be a very cold day and you just have clear temperatures. So you could imagine we could do additional branching. Um, so I'm just going to highlight the text within our clear section, right? So within our if statement, we've got clear in some text, snow in some text, and then rain in some text. And I've highlighted where we've already gone inside the clear. So we know the weather is clear. And we can now just branch on temperature. So let's say if temperature is greater than, I don't know, 60, we want to talk about our Amazon t-shirts. If it's not, you know, maybe if temperature um, is greater than 40, we want to say, grab a long sleeve shirt. And finally, we might want to say, um, get yourself uh, a hoodie because you're a techie after all. So notice as I'm doing this, um, parts of what we've been doing with Wordsmith are trying to figure out where you have problems in designing natural language that you might miss if you're deep in your code and not testing constantly. So one of those is just understanding where you are in the sentence that you're trying to design. So in the preview in the top, you can see we highlight just the bit that we're editing. So as an example of that, let's go a little deeper and just make a synonym. How about the word handy? So a synonym is just a random choice. So instead of a logical if statement where we have a rule and what to say, a synonym is just a random choice where we're putting in some permutations just for the sake of having that variability. So maybe handy, convenient. So it's got some suggestions in here based on synonyms. Um, neat and cool. So as Wordsmith generates this language, when it hits this synonym, it's just going to do a random choice between these. And to go a little bit further, we can even do synonyms for entire clauses, just like we did with branches. 
So what if we want to do this for the entire sentence? Well, let's just do a synonym for the sentence. And in one variation, we keep it as is. In the other one, maybe we just flip the sentence around. Pick up a handy Amazon t-shirt because it's a scorcher. Right? So we can not just change our words, but the, the sentence structures themselves. If you imagine this even at the paragraph level, you could rearrange sentences if they were in an order that you could do that. So now, when we go to preview, in two or three minutes here, we've built up a template that understands the different conditions out there, responds to them with what we think is most appropriate based on our branching structure. We're trying to target the conditions and push our brand. It's in our language. It has this dorky text that I put in there, and it speaks French at you in the middle for some reason. And uh, it has some synonyms for random word choices. So this is a really basic example. There are, uh, Rob will show you a more complex one where we built out this template further to account for temperature variations, um, wind conditions, and all that kind of stuff. But the key here is, if this was hooked up to my Amazon Alexa device, uh, first of all, I could have designed this all as a non-developer. And if I need to make a change, now it doesn't need to go through a multi-week or multi-month code review through three stages of testing. I can just do the design on my side. Maybe I'm on the product management team. We can QA it ourselves, and when we're ready, we can publish the latest version of our skill response without engineering having to touch anything. So let me jump back a little bit here, and let's talk about how this is integrated with Amazon for your Alexa skill. So when we make a request of the Alexa device, that goes to something called the Alexa service, and that service has the natural language understanding piece built in, you design a model around the different intents that you could say, right, I want to forecast or I want to know about Bitcoin prices. You get slot information, things like Bitcoin as the equity that I want to look into or the crypto I want to look into, or the city name where I want the forecast. And that intent and slot data is passed on to your application code that you've written. It's either in Lambda or your own service, hopefully running an EC2. And you could go get additional data from an API. So in, in this case, I'm getting crypto prices and equity prices from an API. In the example Rob's about to show you, we go to the Yahoo Weather API to get forecast information. And so now what you've got is your application knows what the intent is, you've got all the data you need to respond, and now you can just hit WordSmith as an API. It's a RESTful HTTPS API where you send in that data, just like we did here for the, um, the weather forecast where the city name, the conditions, and the temperature fire that over to WordSmith, and what you get back is just a plain text narrative. So it goes through your template structure, goes through all the rules and the synonyms and the data values, plugs them all in, factors that all out, and you just get back a string of text, and you just forward that on back to Amazon with the this.tell method that they provide. So pretty simple setup. Um, the data that you send to WordSmith, if you remember our CSV sort of table structure that we played with in WordSmith, that sets up the, the JSON structure that you send, so it's just key value pairs, like a flat set of key value pairs. So you'd have city, colon, then the city name, conditions, colon, rainy. And it's as simple as that. So that's the basics of the integration. So I'll pass it over to Rob now, and he'll go into um, how you actually integrate this with your skill. All right. Thank you, Adam. This sounds like some really fun responses there. All right, so a little bit on the technical side, uh, I help developers build skills and learn how to develop uh, you know, the Lambda code that drives an Alexa skill. Um, as Adam said, it's very easy to integrate to WordSmith. Once you've got one of these templates built, you can uh, just put a web service call within your code to hit one of these templates. You could pass in the data that you want and receive it right back. So, oh yeah, thanks. So here I am, here's a, a template that's been built. This similar one that we just saw, though, with the weather. It's going to be a scorcher, pack an umbrella. The high day is forecasted to become 93. If you can see that. We can, you know, and we can go in here and look at one of the synonyms, for example, become and attain. I'll add another one to show you it's dynamic, like reach, maybe. Click done, okay. So let's see how it would work from an Alexa skill. I have a fully built skill now called WordSmith Weather. 
that we can try it out with different cities. Let's plug in the power. So I'm going to plug in the uh, audio. Close your ears. Sorry. He's going to Gosh, sorry. <laughs> All right, everyone awake? Alexa, open wordsmith weather. Welcome. Say go outside to hear the current weather, or say go outside in Philadelphia, for example, to hear weather for a specific city. Go outside in Minneapolis. It's going to be frigid today. The high for Minneapolis is projected to reach 47. Alexa, ask Wordsmith Weather to go outside in Miami. Right now in Miami, Florida, it's 80 degrees with partly sunny skies. Throughout the day you can expect more of the same, with a high of 82 degrees and a low of 71 degrees. Pretty cool. So the code for this is, um, it's available. You can see it, um, for example, in, we have a, a thing called the Alexa Cookbook where we have sample code and uh, it's pretty easy to take one of our existing projects that calls out to Yahoo Weather, um, put in the API key for Wordsmith, for example. We can even pass it in as a uh, environment variable to our Lambda function and then just use standard HTTPS calls to get send the data that we want, like the city, for example, the slot value of the city we request, and call the weather API, and then with that data coming back, we can turn around and call the second API, Wordsmith, uh, and get the results back. Sound good? Yeah, so this, um, the code that we're looking at here, if you look at the equity request, so the alpha.data.daily, that's just the, it's called alpha vantage, is the free API that we're using to get that financial information. So we're just building up a promise there. Alpha.daily, uh, and then I put in Amazon. We just hard-coded it to Amazon. But you could pass in your slot value there. So you said, tell me the price of Google, for example. But you'd be passing in G-O-O-G instead of A-M-Z-N. And then it's just a series of promises where we get the data back from the API, pass it to Wordsmith, and that function is just above there called get Wordsmith narrative, which likewise is just a promise-based, so this is a node, a promise-based way of uh, hitting that uh, project and template and wordsmith that we built with our data that we got from that API. And then the final then, just before the catch, we get just a string back narrative. And the this.emit, if you've used the Alexa cookbook at all, it's got the, uh, or the Alexa service, the Alexa SDK module that I've required at the top. Um, it's just got this this.emit method that we can use. We tell it to tell it rather than ask it, yep. and we just pass narrative. So that's just the string that we got back from the Wordsmith API, and the integration is that simple. Yep. That's right. Here's a look at the, the weather code exactly itself. Um, so you could possibly put in your key here directly, but it's uh, standard JavaScript. Uh, in this case, you can see how we've got the two APIs. We call Yahoo Weather API here with some details. Um, and then when we say go outside, it's going to call that API and pass in the city slot. And then it goes to this get wordsmith narrative function. It's a helper function I've put at the bottom of my code. Let's take a quick look at that. After we've received all the data, we simply, can you see it there? Yeah, we make a uh, call here to api.automatedinsights.com. We have a path that kind of identifies the, the project that we want to reach. And the data that comes back gets returned to the caller. Basically, the text is pre-formatted and ready to go. Uh, and then it just gets sent out to uh, this dot emit to respond to the Alexa device. So I, I really like this. I think it's um, a way to make your skills sound much more human and even a little bit unpredictable. Um, just like talking to a real person, it would be very boring, I think, to, to uh, you know, have you hear the same exact response every day. Should we show the state demo? Sure, let's do it. Yep, all right, so let's do a little experiment. Let's see which one of these two skills uh, sounds more fun. This is a really simple skill I wrote called uh, State Games. So there's kind of two versions. One is the static version without any natural language generation, no variability at all. So let's see if it sounds boring or not. Alexa, open State Games static. Welcome to the State Games. We can play either coast to coast or bigger pop. Which would you like? Coast to coast. OK. To play coast to coast, we need to travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Ready to begin? Florida. 
Starting from Florida, going to which state next? Georgia. You said Georgia. Where to next? Alabama. You said Alabama. Where to next? Mississippi. You said Mississippi. Where to next? Louisiana. You said Louisiana. Where to next? Alexa, stop. Okay. See you next time. My friend Andrea does a, a talk about this. He says people really do not like to hear the same exact thing every time. People really do not like to hear the same exact thing every time. <laughs> Let's see how we can improve it. If we just put some synonyms there to a couple of parts of the response, I think it'll sound more fun, especially for these long multi-turn games where uh, you have a lot of back and forth and a lot of turns. Alexa, ask State Games Dynamic to play coast to coast. Okay. To play coast to coast, we need to travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Ready to begin? New York. Starting from New York, going to which state next? Pennsylvania. You said Pennsylvania. Next move? Maryland. You said Maryland. Next state? Virginia. You picked. Virginia. Next move. Ohio. Ohio does not、oh. border Virginia.、All、Try、right. one of these. Alexa. North. Stop. There you go. So you、okay. have to have really good geography、time. as well. Okay. See you next time. But、uh, yeah, it sounds like it would be a little bit more fun.、Um, another thing I like to do is, you know, you can imagine with those synonyms, you could have one out of your five synonyms be slightly snarkier. Right, so you get a little bit of unexpected personality、uh, at certain points during your your、uh, gameplay. No.、Um, am I good? Should we jump back to the slides?、Yeah. Jump back again. Yep. Just this button. Okay, I'll plug it back in. I got that.、Done. Okay. All right.、So、we kind of talked about this. So. To wrap this up a bit,、um, what we're talking about is combination that Amazon's pioneered with natural language understanding, where they've made the Alexa Skills Kit available to all of us, so that we can use the service to understand the intents and the slot values of our users. And what we're trying to pair it with is natural language generation to create the response. And just to summarize the three things that we talked about being important that natural language generation adds: one is you can get very granular and precise with the language that you use. Based on logical rules at a really deeply nested structure, so that we can pick what is most important to tell the user, based on anomalous data that we see, outliers that we find in the data, the things that they are interested in, and the second most important thing is that we can vary our language and our diction, just like Rob showed. No one likes to hear the same thing twice. And then finally, that we can design tools purpose-built for Alexa responses and natural language generation. That makes it easy for non-technical users to get in there and get their hands dirty and help us build our skills. So together, I think that leads to an actual, real shot at making conversational UIs that pass the uncanny valley and get much more towards interacting in a human-like way with computer systems that are trying to understand and respond to to us based on that information. So thanks very much. We will take questions in the back. Um, it's being recorded, so we're not allowed to take live questions. But Rob and I will be back in the back, and we've got some time, so we can、uh, answer any questions that you have.、Um, I'll leave you with our website here, automatedinsights.com. Hit that up, and you can get a free demo,、uh, and we'll show you how it all works and talk about how you could integrate it with your Alexa skills. So thanks very much. <laughs>